On the cover of this, of this week's bulletin, you'll see a photo of the Holy Chalice of Christ, the Holy Grail, Holy Sangreal of Valencia, Spain. Now, on, and if you look carefully here, on the top, you'll see what is an agate cup. And this agate cup dates from the first century. Now, such stone cups were in vogue for Seder meals around uh, among first century Jews. And in fact, this agate cup also perfectly matches the description of two first century Roman cups in the British Museum, dated from 1 to 150 AD and made of chalcedony and sardonyx, two other stones. Now the golden chalice that is underneath then encrusted with jewels and pearls on which the agate cup is mounted uh, was joined to the original relic in the Middle Ages and from the time uh, from the time there when the chalice was in uh, being protected in a Spanish monastery of San Juan de la Peña. So they were added to the original agate cup to make it seem more worthy uh, of what it really is and what it really is is the cup used by Jesus to consecrate his blood at the Last Supper. Now the following is all taken from a book called St. Lawrence and the Holy Grail, the story of the Holy Chalice of Valencia. And this is uh, published by uh, Ignatius Press by uh, Janice Bennett. So don't want to be <laughs> accused of plagiarism here, here, but here's a summary of, of what she presents, which is, um, which is very fascinating. And, and here is good Catholic history, good Catholic culture on this feast day. Now, there are, two, uh, there are two stories of the Holy Grail, the Holy Chalice of Christ from the Last Supper. There is the legend of St. Joseph of Arimathea who received the chalice uh, from the Lord after the Last Supper. Now, St. Joseph of Arimathea was among a group that included St. Mary Magdalene, St. Lazarus, St. Martha, St. Maximine, who were cast out in a boat to die without oars, without a sail, without food, without water. They were cast out on a boat to die. Well, the boat drifted and came ashore at Marseille, France. And that is where St. Mary Magdalene, St. Martha, and St. Lazarus departed. But St. Joseph of Arimathea and his team that were also on the boat then um, proceeded to go up to Great Britain, to England. And so there are the legends of the Holy Grail and the quest for the Holy Grail in the Arthurian legends. And uh, the belief was that it, it had to be, that there was, there was a seat at the round table that nobody could sit in unless he were an heir of St. Joseph of Arimathea and he was pure of heart. That seat was always left empty. Well, one day, Sir Galahad comes in to, uh, newly into the court and he has a seat at the empty table, at the empty chair. And he does not die, which means he was an heir of St. Joseph of Arimathea and that he was pure of heart. Well, Sir Lancelot, sitting at the same table, thought to himself, that's my son. Therefore, I am an heir of St. Joseph of Arimathea, and I too must be more pure of heart than my son. So the two of them go out on a quest for the Holy Grail. Sir Lancelot is not able to even enter the room, the chapel, where the mysterious Mass is being celebrated because he is of a divided heart, whereas his son, Sir Galahad, has truly a pure and undivided heart. He enters in, beholds the Holy Chalice, the Holy Grail, and he is taken up into heaven. And that is the legend of the Holy Grail in England. But there's also the history of the Holy Grail, which is different. The history of the Holy Grail attests and affirms that St. Peter, 
the first pope, used the holy chalice of Christ to say Mass. And that after the death of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who had held, unto, who had held these relics of the passion and death of our Lord, that St. Peter, after her death, took the chalice to Rome, where the first popes continued the tradition for more than 200 years. Well, during the Roman persecution of Valerian, the church was no longer permitted to own property or possessions of its own. So when the Romans demanded the goods of the church from Pope Sixtus II in the year 258, he entrusted his deacon and treasurer, Lawrence, whom we know as St. Lawrence, he entrusted him with all the ecclesiastical money and possessions, including the cup of the Lord. Now, when the Romans arrested Lawrence and demanded that he turn over the goods, Lawrence devised a plan. He asked for a period of three days to collect everything and used the time instead to disperse it, knowing that he would be martyred just as the Pope had been. He entrusted the Holy Cup of the Last Supper to a compatriot in Rome at the time with orders to send it immediately to Spain, their homeland. Well, the Romans were so angry at their loss that they did not martyr Lawrence in the same way that they had killed the Pope by beheading him. Instead, they devised a torture that was the most hideous and painful ever employed until that time. They tortured him in every way possible and then they condemned him to a slow death over hot coals. Well, the chalice was not free from danger, even in Spain. It was protected by monks in various locales before and after the Moorish invasion of Spain in the year 711. It was turned over to King Martin the Humane in 1399 and was surrendered to the Cathedral of Valencia where it is kept even today. But during the Spanish Civil War, between 1936 and 1939, the precious relic was protected from the riotous crowds of revolutionaries only moments before they burst into the sacred enclosure of the cathedral. A woman carried it in her arms, wrapped in a newspaper, through the throngs of communists, and she hid it in a secret compartment that was built into a wardrobe. Well, the Marxists later ransacked her apartment trying to find it, and although they were only inches from its hiding place, the relic remained undiscovered, and the merciless revolutionaries would have killed her if it were not for the kindness of one of them, who risked his own life by urging his compatriots, his companions, to spare her life. Well, the chalice was then hidden in other unlikely places, in a cupboard in a kitchen of the home of this woman's brother, under the cushions of a sofa, and finally in a niche hollowed out in a stone wall of another home whose owner had no idea where, what it was. He didn't know what was contained until the end of the war when it was removed and returned to the cathedral. Well, let's go back to the 17th century. Gaspar Escolano described the chalice with these words. I'll bring out the picture. What did I do with the picture? I'll bring out the picture again. The entire cup of the chalice is made of a single precious stone, similar to what they call chalcedony, according to what Pliny in Book 37, Chapter 7, relates that the ancients prided themselves on making chalices of these stones. The color of ours is so strange and extraordinary that as it is turned, different lights and colors are formed that give off radiance when looking at it, so that the cup begins to lose its original color, although at first sight it is true that it appears to be like a dying ember. Well, that describes the Holy Chalice of Valencia. Now, I won't go on, but all of the various ornaments underneath are symbolic of uh, various things that St. John the Apostle describes in the book of the Apocalypse about the Holy City, with the pearls and the stones and such. 
Well, so that describes the Holy Chalice of Valencia. But what about the supposed grail in England? Now, it could be that the Holy Grail in England, which was mentioned by the Venerable Bede around the year 800, was a silver chalice that was reputedly used by Christ at the Last Supper. Now, according to St. Bede's description, the cup of the Lord was placed in the hollow of a pillar in a plaza in Jerusalem. It was made of silver with a large cup that held the sponge that was offered to Jesus on the cross. Pilgrims would insert their fingers through the iron mesh that covered it. Well, that same Escalano, who described Escalano, Gaspar Escalano, who described the chalice in the 1700s, the same Escalano believed that the Lord used two cups on the night of the Last Supper, and that according to St. Jerome, one cup was used for the dinner of Passover lamb, and the other for the institution of the Most Holy Sacrament. And he says that according to other authors, the cup that the Lord drank with the meal of lamb was of silver, and that of the consecration of stone. So that accounts for uh, there being more than one reputed chalice of, of Christ, except that we could understand that the silver chalice was not the sangrio, wasn't the the chalice used for the consecration of the Eucharist, of the precious blood, and therefore it would not be considered the Holy Grail itself, but merely a chalice that was used by Christ. Now, in, or in arguing that the actual chalice of Christ was used by St. Peter and subsequent popes in Rome, there is a fine difference we can observe in the words of consecration used in the West as compared with the words used in the East. Now, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the Greek rite of the Eucharist, ordained by that Bishop of Constantinople in the 6th century, at the moment of the consecration of the wine, says simply, in like manner he took the cup with the wine, saying, etc. Now, on the other hand, the Roman canon of the Mass at that moment says, in like manner after he had supped, taking also this excellent cup into his holy and venerable hands, and giving thee thanks, he blessed and gave it to his disciples, saying, etc. Now, scholars believe that it is important for the question of the grail. Why does the Roman tradition specify this cup, whereas the Greek does not? It merely refers to the cup. Well, the Greek tradition would not use that adjective because it did not have the holy cup of the Last Supper in its possession. The Roman canon, on the other hand, originated in the celebrations presided over by Peter, or celebrated by Peter and his successors. It is quite likely, it is quite likely then, that the cup was handed over to Peter, who would have used the words, this cup, when saying Mass. And the popes who followed received the very same cup from Peter and continued the very same formula that was consolidated in the second century, continued intact into the third until it was finally recorded into the fourth century as a stable part of the formula of the Roman canon. So we have the whole history of the Mass as it has come down to us today. Now you can read more of this fascinating story in this book. I'm, I'm not trying to sell the book, but it is a fascinating story. And it's good to know these things uh, because it can help us to grow in our faith of the actual things that exist, that are of history, and uh, from Christ himself that have come down to us today, and the importance of that for our spiritual life. So on this solemnity of the precious blood, let us marvel at the gift that our blessed Lord has passed down in the sacrament of the Eucharist. In order to consecrate the Eucharist, the blood of Christ must be separated from his body in order to be joined to it again. Because to be joined to it again is the resurrection. Our Lord must die in order to be resurrected. That happened once 
on the cross on Good Friday, which we commemorate today. And then it is uh, it's the presence of the Lord's death and resurrection is multiplied. His death and resurrection is not multiplied, but is the presence of that is multiplied every time that Mass is offered. So we remember the Lord in his death, which is made present in the consecration of the chalice. Now we do not have the chalice of the Last Supper here, but our chalice here is consecrated. It's consecrated and it must be used and it must be consumed by the priest in order to consummate the sacrifice itself. But let us remember that traditionally only a priest would consume that because it has to be consumed, it can't be wasted. But let us remember also that only a priest and a deacon can even handle the chalice with their bare hands. Others must use gloves to handle the consecrated vessels that hold the Eucharist itself. And so that helps us to venerate the very chalice. And that this chalice on the altar represents the very chalice that was used by St. Peter and subsequent popes there in the Roman Rite. Now think about that today as we are praying, as you are praying along in your missal. Think about that as you're following along where it says this illustrious chalice, this excellent chalice, hunc preclarum calicem. And let us venerate every blessed chalice used on every altar for this purpose. Now like Sir Galahad in the legend, who is able to behold the Holy Grail and enter into its mysteries and be taken up into heaven, we can understand that only the pure of heart can apprehend such a thing. Let us seek to be pure of heart, like Sir Galahad. Let us seek to be pure of heart to apprehend such a thing, to be taken up into the mysteries of the precious blood and to be taken up into heaven at our end. Nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen.